Hi, everybody. This is Jay Halfond. I'm very pleased to welcome Laura DeVoe here with me today. Um, this, this series of conversations with experts is targeted primarily at Boston University's um, program in higher education administration that's part of Wheelock College. And both Laura and I teach in that program. And so it's a pleasure for me to welcome Laura, and I want to give her an opportunity to tell us her journey throughout her careers and what she's doing. She's currently consulting, but that doesn't begin to capture the variety of the various things that she has done. And so, Laura, welcome. Um, I think I would kick it off really any way you'd like to, but I'm curious about your personal journey. In other words, how did you get into first residential life and then things beyond that? And of course, part of your journey, I should remember to mention, includes being a student yourself in yeah. the higher education administration program. So. So I'm reminding myself to, 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 for that, that we, should, we, should, we should tie that in as well. But, but sort of in the, in the beginning, you know, yeah. when, when God created Laura, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what brought you to what, what you were doing? Well, thank you, Jay, for having me. And I appreciate this very much. Um, so when you think back, you know, I was a Boston University student back in the mid 80s, okay? and uh, came to BU to, to go to the College of Communications. I was a uh, journalism major. Mm. And when I was there, um, I got into all the things that you know, students find their way into. And, and one of the things that I found my way into was being a resident assistant. Oh. Um, and I did other things, radio station, I was the school mascot, Rhett the Terrier, like all kinds of those little things that you do. Um, you dressed up as a dog? I dressed up as a dog, yes. I got to travel to London with the football team because we had football at the time. Um, and I got to go to the NCAA basketball tournament and was on national television facing, facing off against the Duke Blue Devil. It was like, you know, those are the things that, you know, my father still talks about that. My father still thinks that's like the greatest thing that I've ever accomplished in my 52 years of life, right? Um, but anyway, so uh, when, I was in, when I was at BU, hmm. um, and I graduated in 1989, and Jay, you will recall that in 1989, we were uh, in a situation uh, with the economy that there were not a lot of jobs, right. okay? and um, while I was a journalism major, the internet didn't exist. Um, the only thing to write for were newspapers and magazines, and there weren't a lot of those jobs. And when I graduated from BU, um, I kind of strung together some part-time journalism jobs uh, around the Boston area. Um, but I was... Uh, looking for permanent work and I didn't want to leave the B the Boston area and move home to New York. Um, and I was actually speaking of Rhett the Terrier, part of the reason I got working at Boston University at the time was because I got a call from the athletic department and they said, hey, you got a check here um, and do you want it? It was, we used to get paid $15 a game to do Rhett, okay? So it was a, it was a $45 check. All right. And they called my house in New York. My mom found me. I mean, this back in the old, you remember back in the old days when you couldn't just get a phone call on your cell phone, you had to get like 16 different phone calls and then finally they find you. Right. Yeah. And so I called over the athletic department. I went over, I went to pick up the check and the athletic director was there and he said, what are you doing? And I explained and he goes, well, we have a job. And I said, well, I, what's the job? And the job was working in the athletic department doing, uh, sports marketing and I knew nothing about marketing but they knew I knew how to be read so clearly I knew how to sell something right. right and I enjoyed that and it got me into the BU um you know employment pool so to speak um and that's when I started taking classes at what was then the school of education um because i said you know what i need a master's degree everybody's telling me i need a master's degree so i might as well get it for free and that's what i did okay. and while i was there um jobs opened up in the office of residence life and i applied for one of the resident hall director jobs and i moved over there because while i liked working in athletics 
-hmm. the work I did was really marketing and it was not something that I was passionate about, nor was it front facing with students. Um, it was really working with advertisers and things of that nature. So I, I found my way over to residence life and that's where I had the bulk of my career in higher education was in residence life, um, working at not only Boston University, also at Indiana University of Pennsylvania out in Western Pennsylvania. Um, came back to BU um, after being at IUP for a while because I was getting married and my husband was from Massachusetts. So I came back here and, you know, I always say to people, you know, don't burn bridges. You got to make sure you're able to come back to a place and BU welcomed me back, which was great. Um, <clears throat> I left BU, went to Babson College, um, went to Endicott College, okay. um, came back to BU after Endicott, then went to Mount Ida College um, out in Newton, Massachusetts, uh, where um, I did, uh, I moved my way up uh, there um, and was eventually the Vice President for Student Affairs. Okay. Um, and I was at Mount Ida until uh, it closed. Uh, actually, you're interviewing me on April 6th. So two years ago today, okay. Mount Ida announced its closure. Happy anniversary. Thank um, you. But backing up a, a, a little bit, and we'll, 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 we'll kind of keep our audience in suspense about the, the issues involving Mount Ida for a few minutes. Okay. Um, were you living uh, on campuses as, as a residential yeah. advisor and director? Oh. So from 1992, yeah. uh, when I started in the Office of Residence Life at Boston University, all the way up until 2008, sorry, 2018, excuse me, I lived on college campuses. Every single place I lived okay. on. I'm trying to do the math quickly. That, that, that's, that, it, it, that's a, you know, a quarter of a century. Okay. Yes. And, and if you count the four years I was an undergrad, I think now I got it. Now this is real math. So I'm 52 years old. Right. <laughs> I think right <laughs> now I'm about, I'm about to the point where half my life was lived on a college campus. And you know, it's, yeah. um, if not more, because that reason I went into journalism was I, I suck at math. So anyway, um, <laughs> but the, but the reality is that, you know, when you look at it that way, you really kind of look at life through a very different lens. Sure. And my, I joke with my husband because now we live, um, we live in a, a place uh, outside of Boston and a grown up uh, house. Yes. Yes. And a grown up house where we actually, you know, like right now that you're interviewing me in the middle of this coronavirus thing. Right. And yeah. I literally have said to my husband, I'm like, God forbid something break in the house, because that means we have to bring someone in potentially, or we have to fix it ourselves, <laughs> which is like, it, no, it's like, I mean, it's like uh, I, for years, I was just like, where's my phone? I got to call somebody, <laughs> the toilet's backed up, <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't right. know how to do things on your own. So what's in your DNA that makes you want to spend a quarter of a century living with young people? College students? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a fool. No, um, no, it's admirable. I think it's, well, what you need I, I think it's actually, this is that I get a lot of energy from young people in it. And I think that I find uh, young people, specifically your traditional age college student, um, you know, it, it, someone once said this to me, like every fall the new class shows up and they're a year younger or, or they stay the same age and we get a year older. Right, right. And it's one of those things where you go, well, that you don't really think of it that way until you kind of like, you know, when you say something and they look at you like, like for instance, this past weekend, I was in a, a training program, a virtual training program, and someone was talking about a Rolodex activity and no one knew on the call. Like I was the oldest person on the call. Um, and you know, two thirds of the people on the call didn't know what a Rolodex was. So sometimes you say things and they look at you oddly. But I think, um, I think residence life as a field, and especially when you move up through the ranks, I think if I had been somebody who stayed in one position for that amount of time, I just, I don't know how you get inspired or how you kind of think through things in a strategic way, which is, I'm a problem solver. I like to look at things through a strategic lens. I like to be able to balance tradition with opportunity and forward thinking. Um, 
But I think with students living in the halls, there is a certain amount of interest in residential life to me is it's got like almost this perfect balance of helping uh, operations, uh, crisis management, uh, critical thinking, uh, you know, there's a, there's all the belt programming. It's got all kind of the student services, student affairs, uh, portfolio all jammed into one job. And that's actually, I think part of the reason I, I glommed onto it and really stuck with it for that amount of time, because it, it never got boring to me, especially as I kept moving up through the, you know, the seniority. Yeah. And when you kind of think about it, it, to me, that's, I always say to people, look, I said, if you really want to do, re do student affairs, you got to do residence life. You just have to do it because it, it really cuts through all the other things. Uh, and, and you'll never get, pigeonholed like you might with some of the other types of jobs. So for instance, I have a very close friend who's in disability services and he likes what he does, but he's been doing it for 30 years. And he's like, I'll never get out of disability services because people yes, don't yes. think I know how to do anything else. Hmm. And, you know, I think when it comes to uh, any kind of student affairs area, starting out and having a good residence life uh, foundation is never going to do you wrong. I really, truly believe this. Now, people may say I'm biased. I am the first person to say I'm biased. I am the first person to say it because ultimately those kinds of jobs, they help you also figure out what it is that you really are passionate about. A lot of people come through residence life and they say, you know what? I know I want to do programming. I know I want to do first year student services. I know I want to do uh, social justice programs. I know I want to do student conduct. You get all of that in residence life. And so yeah. you get that taste. But you, but you get it 24 like, hours. And right. you, you, you've, you've given up your, your privacy for that, uh, of course. Yes. Um, and I'm sure after a while you, you, you've learned to live without privacy, but. Um. Well, and I also think that I was able to, so one of the things I'll say about Boston University and my experience at BU, so the total number of years that I did at BU in residence life yeah. was uh, 10 years. Okay. okay. So I worked at BU for 13 years, but three of those years were in athletics. Okay. And so 10 years, and it was broken up because I left and came back three times. Um, BU, um, and I will say this to David Zamoyski and to Ken Elmore and to Jack Weldon, who were, you know, people who created that department, right. it, it uh, spoils people in residence life in that they all have an administrative assistant. There is no other place I've ever worked that had that level of administrative support for a residence hall director. Right. That, that okay. helps quite a bit. That helps a lot. You're not doing kind of those little pieces of, you know, like you, you can learn to delegate and you get, to, and, yeah. and I think that actually helps you as a professional too, because you learn how to work with uh, an opportunity to delegate out and what should you be hanging on to and what can you give to somebody else to do. All right. right. The other thing about the BU program is you never had students to your apartment. Like it was even in the days before it was like not a good idea um, because, you know, back in the, back in the early nineties, the, the kind of some of the stuff that we did was like, it still makes my hair fall out. But, you know, the, it was never like your apartment was never kind of open to okay. other, to the students. And I've interviewed at places. And even when I worked at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, for instance, part of the culture there was. The, the resident staff apartments were kind of like a place for the staff, the student staff to hang out yeah. um, or you would have open door time. Yeah. And when I interviewed for some jobs at some schools, I mean, some places your office was in your apartment. Right. Um, and, you know, 
I even interviewed with some folks where like they said, oh yeah, my, you know, you can, you can get into my apartment through that office door and students just come walking in. I'm like, oh no, like, I mean, and that, and those are the kind of things that as students or as people are looking at jobs in residence life, I say, well, what is it that they actually have baked into the program to give you some, some, you know, kind of distance. Um, when I was a director of residence life at a couple of places at Endicott and at um, Mount Ida, um, I had um, my, my house, because in those two cases, I had a small house on campus. Okay. Um, it was out of the way. So I actually had physical distance. My, my living accommodations weren't right in a residence hall. Okay. However, I had to pass my office. I had to pass through campus every time to get to my house. So that idea of feeling cut off, it, it you don't because you see everything and you're like, and you're literally you're driving back from the supermarket and you're like, I really need to stop right. talk, and talk tell to this story. kid to, you know, put, put, put the sword down, you know, or whatever he was doing, you know. But I'm sure a really nice aspect of residential life, I, I used to always think, when I held administrative jobs in and, and, and would be teaching as well, that I'm really not seeing students at night. I'm, I'm seeing them in their daytime um, persona, in a sense, right. and, and right. In, their, in their sort of well-behaved coming into class or coming into a dean's office yeah. and really not seeing the full range. And when I would stay later in the evening, I'd realize that there's a whole other cultural experience that yeah. students are going through in, in what are really my off hours, in a yeah. sense. Yeah. It's not their off hours. And so, so, so the vantage point must be fascinating to kind of see them in, in their other side in the, yeah. when, when, they're, when they're acting out in any number of different ways. And, um, and, right. and, and you, you get to know the real people in some ways. Yeah. You get to see the, the four-dimensional person that this human is, right? And, um, you know, and in various states of, of, put together too. Like, so, yeah. I mean, one of my favorite times to interact with students was always Sunday brunch yeah. because that was a time, that, first of all, I love a good omelet, right? And so I don't want to have to cook it myself. So I will go down to the dining hall and, and get that omelet. Yeah. And that was a time that I was casual. They were super casual and everybody is just walking around kind of doing their thing. And I used to love Sunday brunch as this like interaction point because it's actually the time where you know from a from a risk of seeing something you don't want to see standpoint sunday brunch is like a pretty innocuous time right yeah. and so you get to just see the students just being them and who they're hanging out with and all that um yeah. <clears throat> being that when you are um, on campus at night I think a lot of times the residents life staff end up becoming people that are targeted for going to games, going to art events, going to various other types of uh, programs on campus. And they actually feel like they have um, a certain amount of responsibility to make sure that the students feel supported right. and um, that they themselves are actually seeing and supporting students in the things that they're passionate about. And, and that is actually one of the nicest things about it, is that when you are able to be on campus um, with such regularity right. um, and you can go watch games or you can, you know, go applaud for students in, in an event or whatever, um, yeah. it really kind of brings it all together. And, and yeah. it actually, I think, I always said to my staff, like, you need to have your own time. You need to enjoy your own things. Please, you know, go to yeah. movies, go to, go to, um, go to the gym, do the things that you care about. But also when you're on campus and you're going to these things, remember that student in their best moment. Yeah. Okay. Remember that student, because when you see them in their not so best moment, <laughs> when you see them in a time where they have to meet with you because maybe they made a mistake or maybe they did something that was just poor judgment. Um, it is always great to be able to say, hey, you know what, Jay? I saw you in the basketball game the other day. I saw what kind of leader you are. I saw I you with, with your yeah. thing. You know, this is not, it, I know that this moment is not 
the J indicative. moment. Right, right. Okay. It's not indicative. Right. And when they see you sitting back and cheering them on, and then you're able to talk to them in another kind of mode right. um, in a time when they are, have been challenged, um, it actually helps with the process of, of kind of assisting the student through okay. challenging times. So I appreciate all the gratifying aspects of it. So, so, so now, you've, you, now you're going to wean yourself from the, the intimate experience with students in which you're living amongst them towards yeah. to getting your own house and, and uh, on campus, then, then eventually moving up the administration. Um, talk about that experience in terms of its gratifications and its challenges. Yeah. Um, so so, so, so w were you ever residential at Mount Ida? Uh, yeah, at Mount okay. Ida, I was there. So when I got hired at Mount Ida, um, as the director of residence life, I lived on the campus in a small house. And then when I became the vice president for students, so as I moved up at, through the dean of students office and that sort of thing, they kept me on campus because, frankly, one of the things I'm good at is emergency response. Okay. okay? Like, I'm, I'm pretty damn good at getting shit done pardon my french okay and so when i watch how you know how things are happening with the coronavirus i literally let you know it's like everything i could do not to stab myself in the head when i'm watching these press conferences but anyway so when i um <clears throat> well i wanted to say one other thing real quick is that yes being in residence life is gratifying and all that but i think that for those folks who become their entire life is the living on campus and they, their whole social life is there, their whole being is there. I get very aggravated with that. Hmm. And I never, and that was actually something I learned at BU is that people had lives outside of res life. Hmm. And when I worked at IUP in the University of Pennsylvania, everyone's whole social life was also with the people they worked with. And I just, that was part of the reason, while I liked the people I worked with there very much, and I still have some very close friends there, I was very clear with people like, look, I need a life. I can't just be with you folks all day. And I, when people are looking for jobs at places and they find out, oh yeah, we all go out together, we all do this together, I say that's a red flag because that is how you burn out. Right. And I'm I'm a good example that you can live and and survive and thrive and for that life. amount of time, but you have to be able to turn it off and you have to have things that you care about. So okay. I got involved with not for profits off campus. I did like, you know, other things. You have to have other things. All yeah. right. So when I got hired at Mount Ida, I'm going to be honest with you, Jay. Part of the reason I looked at Mount Ida, I was I had a great job at BU. I was an assistant director of residence life. Now the the same positions for those folks who are at BU and know anything about res life. They're, they they recalibrated the jobs when I left, and now they're all associate directors. But anyway, so I ran um, the RA selection and training and the faculty and residence program and that sort of thing. And I really loved my job at BU. But I just had I had just adopted my daughter, and um, <clears throat> was living in Boston, and I was already feeling, even though she was only 11 months old, I was always I was already feeling this level of okay, where's she gonna go to school? Because I need her to be able to go to public school, and Boston public schools not very strong, and I was already freaking out about it. And so when the director of residence life job came open at Mount Ida, it came with a house and I, already, and I knew Mount uh, Newton public schools are very strong. Right. And so I applied for the job and that's, that's really the reason I applied. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> right. And so I'm going to be really honest about that. <laughs> and so when I got to Mount Ida, small school, so it couldn't be more counter, it couldn't be more different than Boston University. Okay. So it was in, um, it was very small, only about 1,100 students, um, about 750 living on campus at the time. Um, so I, I kept joking with people, like I could put all the students at Mount Ida and Warren Towers and still have extra beds. Like I, I, that's how small the place was. Um, over time, 
uh, I was able to, one of the things they said to me when they interviewed me, um, one of the vice presidents asked this question to me and said, <clears throat> what, and I thought it was a bad question. Like, I'll be the first one to say, this is a stupid question. Okay. Is that they said, what is it about your candidacy that sets you apart from the other candidates? And I'm like, well, first of all, I don't know who the hell else is applying for this job. So who the frick knows? But one thing I'm very good at is operations. And so I think that, you know, that's typically the thing that sets me apart from a lot of other people. So I would say operations. And he said to me, well, this may not be a good fit for you because here at Mount Ida, we care more about relationships. And I said, well, then I may not be the candidate for you because I believe that unless your operations are the great equalizer, because I think if you have good operations and people know what, to, what they're in for, then they're gonna trust your office. If you're only about relationships, my relationship with an office may be different from Jay's relationship with an office, and they may not feel like they're getting fair shot. Right. And so he was, <laughs> we never got along that well, me and that vice president, but. <laughs> you eventually replaced them too. I right? bet, yes. <laughs> so. um, but um, yeah. I became the, and part of the reason that I became the vice president for student affairs mm was um, we had a new president come in um, in 2012 okay. and <clears throat> fall 2012 and that fall was Hurricane uh, Sandy. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was Superstorm Sandy. Um, it was also the very first weekend of school so we had, we had been, he came in that summer, he identified a residence hall, our largest residence hall on campus. It had a real deep need for some major work mm -hmm. and they started doing the work. And during move in that, that school year, um, the fire department showed up saw all the construction still going on. So we had some students already displaced in a hotel. We couldn't have everyone move in yet. There was black mold. I mean, like, I'm not even gonna tell you, there was a lot of problems, okay? The fire department came in and said, we are um, closing the building. Hmm. No one can be here until all these things are taken care of. So I had five hours to find housing for 400 students, okay? Yeah. And get them off, and I needed to find them transportation and wireless internet. <laughs> right. And I had to go. Right. And so part of the reason I was somebody that the president all of a sudden now knew who I was is I was able to get that done. Oh, okay. And he, he actually said this, he was like, no one, you know, FEMA's got nothing on Laura DeVoe. Like this woman could get stuff done and get people moved and all that. Right. And so that response to the crisis. The, that, that emergency. And then a, about a month and a half later, we had her, we had Superstorm Stan, Sandy, which ended up being a huge problem. We had no power for five days. I mean, it was, it was bad. Um, but I help I helped to coordinate that effort. <clears throat> and because I could handle the pressure, he then um, came to me and said, look, I'm gonna, the vice president for student affairs is gonna move on, which often happens when you have a new president come in to an institution, people at the cabinet level, it's like when you hire a new football coach, right. the, the coaching staff changes. You clean and so, she was she was looking she saw the writing on the wall and she was looking for a new new opportunity and he asked me to step in okay so um how much did you know and when did you know it as far as mount ida's problems yeah that's the most popular question people have so yeah um when i took over as vice president the president also asked me to stay living on campus because mm -hmm. he wasn't living on campus and he wanted somebody from the from the cabinet level there. Okay. All right. So they moved me to what was the president's house because he didn't need the house. Okay. 
right. he moved. Um, he, he actually lives in Newton. He still lives in Newton. He has lived in Newton his whole life. So him and his, his family live in Newton. Right. And so um, when I was the vice president there, we were doing a lot to try to level out the, the institution. We did a strategic plan um, in the first year that he was there from 2012 to 2013. Um, we started implementing the plan that, that year. Um, we, did a, we worked with Noel Levitz, which is now Ruffalo Noel Levitz on our um, enrollment strategy. Uh, we did a ton. We rebranded. We did everything you're supposed to do to kind of right the ship. Okay. And when we did our enrollment strategy, and I think this is important for folks to know, we didn't do what a lot of schools do. We went up in terms of our admission requirement. We didn't go down. And it actually was something where people were, were like, why would you do that? You were supposed to kind of broaden the funnel, okay, to bring in more people uh, and, and that sort of thing. And we said, no, we've got to, we've got to move ourselves up in terms of people seeing us as a viable place. We need to bring in more students who might be more, um, likely to succeed. Um, our enrollment should be really focused on retention as much as it is about enrollment. Um, so when we're talking about enrollment, oftentimes people think about that first year student enrollment. We were trying to heighten our overall retention and then our graduation rates. Okay. And so we, I was in lockstep with the provost. The provost and I worked so well together. And now I'm not saying Ron and I agreed on everything. We had fights. I mean, we would yell about stuff, but then the next, you know, then like, who's going to lunch? I'm going with you. Like, you know, we got along, even though sometimes we didn't always agree. But the one thing we always agreed on was that whatever we're doing has to be for the long-term benefit of the institution. Right. Okay. Um, so things were really going in the right direction. There was one year, and now I'm, I can't remember, I think it was the, the winter of 2015 when we had, there were like six weeks in a row where we had snow from January yeah. on. I remember and and that was a horrible spring retention for us because mm. while Mount Ida was a predominantly residential campus, 36% of our students were commuters. Yeah. And that year, the commuter student retention rate went into the tank. Mm. And that, that year, that particular issue and that financial hit um, in terms of, of retention was something that was was going to be kind of our like almost like the the first like that was almost like pa patient zero like that was something we couldn't necessarily recover from but we weren't the problem was we weren't really uh, aware of how much that was going to have long term effects. It okay? was a turning point. And so that that is a definitely an issue. Um, and then. <clears throat> The spring of 2017, um, so literally we're going into commencement weekend, spring of 2017, and we got, uh, we got pulled into a meeting and the president said, the president of LaSalle and I, we want to have our, our ca uh, cabinets meet. And we're like, why? <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, well, there's like some stuff going on. We're like, all right. So planning a marriage. Yeah. And so we all met on the Monday or Tuesday after commencement. And um, and it was weird because it was the LaSalle cabinet and the Mount Ida cabinet, and they were on one side of the table, we were on the other side of the table. And, you know, I was joking with one of my colleagues after it was over. I'm like, we, it looked, it was, it was just so tense. It was like this very weird situation. Right. And it was the two presidents said, we need to start to consider that the institutions that are small, but healthy fall into like 3,500 to 5,000 enrollment. Okay. Mount Ida and LaSalle were both 
under 3000. We were both in about the, the 1200 to 1700 range. Yeah. And the idea was if we could find a way to merge, how we could be more viable as an, as an entity, as a merged entity. So we started a conversation that, that May and it was on, off, on, off, on, off for the next year. And in the spring of just after January uh, semester started, uh, we made an announcement that the institutions were, so that was spring of 2018, um, we were looking into conversation doing this this merger and the reason we had to have that public conversation was because if you are uh if you, your creditors need to know um so that has to become public so your creditors have to know um the other thing you have to do in this and in massachusetts there is never a merger of equals hmm. okay there's always one party that is going to be the acquiring party. Right. Okay. So when you look at the Boston University Wheelock merger, yeah, it's obvious. That, that's obvious. The one that I think when people look at it locally, they they may not have unless they were really paying attention, Berkeley College of Music and Boston Conservatory. Right. Berkeley, they were the, the big dogs. They yeah. have an incredible endowment. They were much healthier financially, even though they were both art schools. Okay. So when it came to Mount Ida and LaSalle, something that LaSalle had that Mount Ida didn't have in their portfolio is they have something called LaSalle Village. Right. And LaSalle Village, for those who don't know, is a um, assisted living, elder care kind of community. Okay. Or learning in residence as well. Right. And they have learning in residence. And so this was set up probably about 20-ish years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the whole concept is that folks can go from LaSalle Village, it's literally adjacent to the college, um, and you could go take classes. You can have kind of this lifelong learning kind of uh, environment, okay? Um, but it's a cash cow because yeah. it is, you know, if you know anything about elder care, it is not cheap to run. Um, and people get premium pricing for this type of an environment. So that was kind of this, like, it, it, and when you look at the portfolio, that was making up on any losses on the enrollment and the, um, the, the college side. Right. Okay. So we were in this conversation. Those of us in the cabinet were not in on a lot of the conversation. We would be brought in as necessary. Mm -hmm. um, where we would share information. Now, for the Division of Student Affairs, so I had athletics, I had residence life, I had disability services, health, counseling, uh, the um, all of the student activities, student center, all of that. Like, so I had, I had 16 functional areas and seven departments, okay? My team was most likely to be cut Sure. in all of this and um, and they knew it like how many i mean you need one men's soccer coach right, right right you need one director of disability services now while you would hope that with an expanded number of students you would hang on to maybe some people so you could have some backup you could yeah. have some bench but that was not what we were hearing we were hearing no we're going to make this a lean operation and so, and then winner um, takes all in a sense. And and yeah. if the now is the winner, that they, they they get exclusive control over that. Right. And so the faculty, on the other hand, those folks were basically told, look, if this goes through, you know, ninety percent of you are going to be fine, yeah. um, because while there is some repetition of some majors, you are going to need to have extra sections of business classes. You are going to have to have. So this is not just that. You know, we're going to make faculty teach more. We're going because we can't. We're going to have. We're going to need more instructors. Okay, so 
the administrative side of the house was quite concerned about this because they're gonna there there's gonna be people who are gonna lose jobs. Um, there was not a consultant brought in to, and there's a lot of consultants out there who specialize in mergers and um, specialize in this type of thing. That's probably you should now if you're not yeah, already. Well, I, I do work with a company, so we do, we do help with that. Um, you but, learn by experience. Yeah, you know, it's called trial by fire, right? Yeah. And so when you have these opportunities, like, and I, I, I actually said it at a meeting, I'm like, we hired a consultants to tell us what colors to be. Why have we not hired a consultant yeah. to talk to us, to walk us through this merger? Because I would rather have someone who has no, no skin in the game right. walking us through. But there was a disagreement from the two boards of trustees about that. And ultimately, the merger didn't go through. Right. And we were told by the president of Mount Ida, well, we have a plan B. And we're like, and that would be what? So then on April 6th, uh, 2018, I got, you know, we made the announcement um, that we were closing Mount Ida and the property was being sold to UMass Amherst uh, to create this UMass Amherst Mount Ida campus um, and no faculty and staff would be retained and all students would be uh, have to find another place to go. Not much of a plan um, B. Yeah, it wasn't much of a plan B for, for any of us. It was a liquidation sale. Yeah, and that's really what it felt like. I mean, um, you know, I remember sitting in my office on Patriot's Day and the classes were closed because you know, we, we had no class on, on Patriot's Day because we were on the marathon route. And um, I was meeting with a staff member and we had at that point decided to move our commencement off campus for the first time in the history of the school. Mm -hmm. We moved it to the pavilion in Boston downtown because we, we knew that we could not contain it from a media standpoint and from a security standpoint, and we needed extra help. And so an old friend and colleague, someone I worked with at Endicott now runs the pavilion. And so I called, I called Bethany and she said, we can, we actually have that date available. Well, you can have it here. I'm like, thank God. Right. Um, and people, it got written up in the Boston Business Journal and people were like, see, they're wasting more money. And actually, I hate to tell people this, it actually saved us $5,000 out of like in comparison. And I didn't have to ha have 90 volunteers to work that day, which try and get 90 volunteers when you've just been told you have no job and you have no, right. no future. Um so I only needed, uh, uh, you know, a dozen volunteers, which I could do, yeah. um, but they had a staff and all that. So like, you know, people, you know, it's just like anyone who's ever gotten married and they say, oh, you can go, go to the hotel and it's super fancy and, or you can do it yourself. And then when you add up what it costs to do it yourself, you're like, I might as well go to the damn hotel. And it's, it's the same idea, but we had always done it on our campus because that's what people wanted. You know, it was, it made it a more, more homey family relational experience. So anyway, so I'm sitting in my office and I'm with these, these folks and we're talking, we're kind of walking our way through like, okay, what, what do we have to do? How can we make this as easy as possible? That sort of thing. And while I'm in my office with, with my, with one of my colleagues and this woman from the pavilion, some people from UMass were walking around with our facilities people and they walked in my office while I'm sitting there with another, you know, two other people and they walk in and they said, yeah, we'll keep that and that and that. And they walked out <laughs> and my friend Bethany was like, did I just see that? And I said, right. yes, you did. Yes. You know? That was the moment. Yep. Yeah, no, but I mean, it literally was like a fire sale, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and that's how you felt was when you were in the yeah. middle of it. But colleges have a real dilemma because if they're, if they're transparent with their stakeholders, 
then of course they're, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're, right. they're, they're scheduling their own demise. And I think right. Mount Ida seemed to, frankly, um, portray non-transparency um, yeah. and, and thus, you know, when, when, it, when, it, when it went under, it, it, it was a shock, it was a trauma. Yeah. No, and it, it absolutely was. So what was happening was that the trustees weren't being as transparent. The CFO wasn't being as transparent. Right. Um, you know, when you look at what just happened, the the the, the um, Joint Commission on Higher Education um, in Massachusetts just put forth a, a requirement that colleges and universities needed to be more transparent with their finances. And the Mount I, Ida rule, probably, right? It, it was. I mean, yeah. like, it was all because of Mount Ida. Yeah. So yeah. last summer, I was asked to testify in front of the Joint Commission. Yeah. And I had five minutes, which now you're, you're like, what the hell am I going to talk about for five? I mean, I could, right. I mean, you know. But one of the things I said, and I, and I mean this, is that just like you just said, like, colleges and universities have to be given some opportunity to if you have strong leadership and strong leadership also includes transparency and being able to be strategic you need to be able to be given a chance to kind of right the ship okay and there is a way to be honest which which we could have done better okay mm -hmm. um and I put myself down as a we there because now I know better. Okay. Right. Now I know some of the things that were not being shared with me that mm -hmm. should I be in a situation in the future, I know what to ask. Yeah. Just like you bought a lemon. Now, you know, right. right? right. Yeah. It's a good experience. In that sense. Right. It's a good experience. You know, after therapy, I can now say, yes, that was <laughs> a good experience. Right. But you know, one of the things that happens as a result of this, is that one of the things I truly feel strongly about, and one thing I didn't talk about yet, was in the fall of 2017. So remember, we announced in the, in the spring of 2018 that we were closing. Right. In the fall of 2017, we went through our 10-year um, accreditation visit with NEASC. Yeah. Okay? In my mind, and I said this to the Joint Commission, I said, Accreditors need to ask different questions when it comes to fiscal health, okay? And it should have a lot of the weight should be on the shoulders of the accreditation process. And we shouldn't be waiting 10 years. I mean, yeah, there's a midterm um, uh, accreditation letter that you're supposed to send in and you do to say, here we are with finances. They do talk to you about wherever you are. If you're on some kind of probation, you do have to do uh, letters more often. There's, there's checks and balances. We were in that vote. We were in that vote because the 10 year before, we had to keep doing these financial. There's, you're asking the wrong questions. If it took 10 years of, of sending in what NEASC wanted, and then all of a sudden, oh, now we're closing. The, we're asking the wrong questions. You know, but I, but I, I'd, I'd hate you know, to, to sort of sum it up a bit. I'd hate for us to all have to kind of live in the shadow of Mount Ida in a no, sense. No, absolutely. That's, yeah, and that's not. And I'm I'm of the mindset where I'm like, I feel bad for everybody else because I know part of the reason why this all happened wasn't wasn't anything to do with finances. It had to do with leadership. Yeah, when yeah. people ask, why did Mount Ida close? There were three reasons Mount Ida closed. Number one, deferred maintenance. Okay. It was, yeah. we, we had $40 million of deferred maintenance when Barry Brown became the president of Mount Ida. Right. Okay. So then you had your debt load. Your debt load became too much. We got loans, loans, loans to try to, to fix that problem. Okay. Mm. So there's your so you've got so with the debt load combined with your discount rate our discount rate was 63 percent no that's it, it, it once it crosses 50 you know it's yeah, yeah. yeah you, so, you, you, you you're buying your students at that point right so your discount rate was too high all right and then the third reason is leadership yeah okay you can figure out a way to pay for that 40 million dollar debt 
or that $40 million deferred maintenance. You can figure out a discount rate that's going to get you the students that you need, okay, that isn't going to cripple you financially. But in order for that to happen, your leadership needs to be good. Okay. And leadership matters. All right. That's great closure. So, um, yeah, it's it was obviously a, a life changing experience. Uh, a pandemic, uh, a global yeah. pandemic, is probably a, a, even a, a less a less impactful trauma for you than uh, than going through that at Mount Ida. But um, well, we had a this past Friday night, we had a little Mount Ida reunion Zoom uh, cocktail party, right? Okay. Yeah, and um, people who are now working on other campuses and they've had to close to send kids home and all yeah. this stuff, yeah. and they're like, it's, tra it's traumatic because you feel like you're living it again. Right. Um, and they said, you know, they've gone to their boss and they're like, yeah. oh, how come you know what to do? They're like, I closed a school. <laughs> I know what it feels like. I know. And, and I'm just, and, and this is for a, a completely different conversation someday, but maybe we should have a session on, on what's going to be the next set of Mount Ida's and, and how yeah. will the pandemic, you know, accelerate that process. But well, I think we've, yeah. we've, We've had a really good conversation. I think I think people followed your your career and and the and the, um, the the comfort you had as a residential director and the and and the challenge of 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 responsibility and right. uh, that that you faced in Mount Ida, which is which is an experience of a lifetime. Well, so that's what my um, I'm in my dissertation phase at Northeastern, okay. and I'm writing on. The closure, closing, basically the whole thought is how to make closure a student-centered process. Right. Um, because right. it it needs to be, you yeah. know, it's a traumatic event and it the is. students need to feel like they matter. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So on that note, maybe, maybe we should have another conversation recorded at some point on that one. Absolutely. Laura, thank you so much for coming out of your hibernation today and, yeah. <laughs> and talking with us. And it was, you, it was a great opportunity to get to know you. And I really appreciate that. Oh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.